Hi. Hey, thanks for having Hello. us. Hello. How's it going? We're good. We're uh, we're happy to be with you, Tom. Oh, come on. I'm so happy to have you. Why that song is the lead? Yeah, well, um, so we put out Blink once, uh, September 21, and Blink twice, which is the companion record, came out in September 22. And Reckoning was actually written in the first batch of songs and could have been on the first record. But then there's a lyric, Blink twice in there. And that led us to call the first record Blink once, and the second record, we could we're like, oh, what if we save that song oh. and we and we call the second record Blink twice? And I was like, okay, this makes sense. And I think a lot of the, sort of just the planning and thinking around the music in the last couple of years was just because we had more time to plan and think about it. Because normally you're in a cycle, you're on tour, there's a rhythm to what we do, but that rhythm was to- thrown totally off during the pandemic. So it was like, okay, how can we be creative? How can we be Taylor Swift like in our strategy. Taylor Swift like? Yeah, you Swiftian. heard me. Swiftian. Swiftian. You heard me right. And uh, you mean strategic. Strategic, yeah. but also just like what are little Easter eggs we can leave. So at the end, if you listen to the the outer lewd track on Blink Once, it's actually a part of Reckoning. So it's a little wink to anybody who's paying close attention that oh, this sounds a little bit different. What are they trying to say here with this odd orchestral song? Is this saying something more? And to us, we were like, you know, you watch a movie, the credits roll, and then there's a final scene at the end that's going to wink towards the sequel. Mm -hmm. That's what we were doing. And we amused ourselves. I don't know how many people actually caught on, but that ended up being Reckoning, which was the first song from Blink Twice. No, I I caught it. (laughs) (laughs) You were on the Reddit board? Oh, no, yeah, I caught it. it. Yeah, Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm big on the subreddit. I I don't know if you guys noticed this, but uh, here's I think they're trying to tell us something. I think they're trying to tell us something. It's like a cut scene at the end of the Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's nice to talk to you guys about, I don't think I've ever, and I've known you guys for a long time. I, I don't, I don't think I've ever got to ask you some of these questions. Uh, how dare you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Question one, Mike, how did you and Max meet? Uh, we met at university. Which one? Uh, McMaster University. So, uh, Max grew up in Toronto. I grew up in Guelph and then we both went to McMaster. Um, and yeah, first week, uh, like welcome week. So we both went out to like, a sort of like a mixer kind of thing where they do like... Separately from one another? uh, Yeah, separately, yeah. So somebody from my residence uh, who was was friends, an old friend with Max's uh, roommate, Chris. uh, And so Chris and the friend, they met up and then we were kind of just like their plus ones. And then, uh, yeah, Max had a kind of funny hat on. Uh, it was like a of, John Lennon Hard Day's Night style hat. Yeah, that, that's what I was, it kind of had a bit of a, con, a conductor <laughs> thing going on, but it was cool. I mean, at the time, especially this was what two thousand and four. So, yeah. and it was good. You know, Welcome Week. You want to put yourself out there, kind of show a bit of flair, and so he did. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a nice way to say it. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we kind of like hit it off uh, over Canadian music. So C- Canadian music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like uh, I had over that summer before going into university gotten into the weaker vans. So, and I had never even seen the weaker vans. I just had their records. It was, had been listening to them. And, and Max asked me like, who's your, who's your favorite band right now? And I was like, I don't know. I've been listening to this band, the weaker vans a lot. I really like them. And Max was a huge fan. And that was kind of, I think a bit of a left field reference. I didn't think that he would know. And he probably didn't think I was going to say that. And I think it hit off that we both, uh, you know, had a passion for music. Were you, were you already, cause I know Max was, were you already playing in bands at this point? Uh, not really, no. So I had I had kind of tried in high school, but we didn't really do much. But Max had done more and was a little more confident, I think, to at least to say like, let's try, like let's get let's get some guitars and like set up in the the welcome or whatever the the common room in a residence, which is a very uh, rude and inappropriate place to <laughs> practice, but we did anyways. And uh, yeah, and I think that's where it really started. Yeah, Mike said, I was said, do you play guitar? He said, oh, kind of. I was like, yeah. you're in the band. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then the next day, uh, a fella came up to me and I was wearing a Sam Roberts shirt, a uh, Sam Roberts band t-shirt that uh-huh. I just purchased a few, like the previous month. And he says, I really like your shirt. I said, oh, you like Sam Roberts? And he said, yeah. I was like, do you play an instrument? So I kind of play the bass. I was like, you're in the band. And that was Nick. And Nick's still in the band. Yeah. <laughs> I had a Tim join. Uh, Tim joined, a, uh, we had a, an original drummer uh, who wasn't as focused. He was probably more focused on school and other reasons he was supposed to be at McMaster. Yeah, not a terrible idea. Yeah. Uh, and we uh, 
we parted ways with him right. and we and and uh we got connected with Tim and uh and Tim was a very very serious about music way more serious than we were really like he was playing in bands he was gigging every weekend he was playing cover bands he was just like looking for his project and so the timing and we're all about the same age too so kind of like everybody was at a very similar place in their life was when when he joins the band because he's so serious is there a part of you that like okay this has to go from jam and covers to taking this a bit more seriously um uh, partially, I mean, I think Tim Tim brought this like professionalism to yeah. what we were doing in the sense that you know your your drummer is like kind of the one thing that everybody notices, like a bad guitar player, or, like you know you're kind of a little off here or there. Like people don't totally notice, but if you have like a bad drummer, <laughs> like or like a, not a, like at a super professional level, even that level of drummer, yeah. you notice. Yeah. So when Tim rolled in and just started like the most dead on beat that I had ever played with for sure and has continued to this day, uh, it makes you feel like a better guitar player. Right. All of a sudden I was like, wait a second, did I get like 30% better in the last <laughs> five minutes? Like, cause, cause it's just all there uh, and it's consistent. And uh, I think that really um, gave us a lot of confidence. But when is the moment where you go like, okay, this is not, this is going to be more than just playing cover. Cause I assume it's like covers. In no, the, uh, we were always into original songs. Like we were yeah. like, there was uh, right from our first rehearsal. We maybe, maybe we eventually started doing covers, but it was always original music. Cause I'd been writing songs in high school mm -hmm. and I had all these songs that I was kind of excited about. And then we started working on them together. Yeah. I think at the time for me, especially that was actually a blessing because learning other songs was quite difficult. But, uh, <laughs> you get to write the own, your own part. I, I get yeah. right. I get to write my own guitar part to that, so I could I could play it. So, but yeah. when, when do you start taking it seriously? We always kind of took it seriously. It's like you know, even so, our first so we met in the fall of two thousand four, two thousand five is the Battle of the Bands. Uh, we we steal a shopping cart from the local grocery store. We put all of our gear in the shopping cart. We roll it across campus, and we win our round of the Battle of the Bands. We end up losing the final round to a ska band called the Johnstones, and they, they deserved it. They deserved. It. They're really good actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then and then a few weeks later, we played at the Casbah, which to us was like we had been going to shows there the whole year. That's we, a bar in Hamilton. That's a bar in Hamilton, right? and, right, yeah. and it's a lot music place and it's really important I think for Canadian music and we'd seen Joel Plaskett there like two months later. I was like oh my god we're gonna play on the same stage that Joel Plaskett just played on this is insane yeah yeah and I, I remember getting the call in at my residence <laughs> on the like the the landline <laughs> Like you oh call, I don't even know how you, could you call, I guess you could call between, call it, yeah. yeah, you had like a number you would put in, but yeah. So like, I remember getting that phone call, like sitting at my desk and being, did I call you? Yeah. You called me and I was terrified because we both didn't have cell phones at the time. Oh wow. That was oh pre cell God. phone. Yeah. <laughs> and you were, and you were like, okay, we're going to play this legendary venue. This is getting, yeah. this is getting real. Yeah. Like, like I, I was so scared. Yeah. We were opening for this band Frantic City mm -hmm. and, um, and we opened and we played our own songs and it went well enough. And I remember one of the guys in the band came to our residence like a week later with like 80 bucks as our fee. <laughs> and I was like, we're getting paid now too. This is incredible. But did you know in that moment, this is going to be our lives? No, 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 no. I mean, we, um, the way things really got rolling for us is that we played North by North. And this is kind of a good story. I think for any like, young musician, we played at one in the afternoon at Young and Dennis square for, uh, North by Northeast. Big gig, big gig. We all were wearing matching shirts and uh, we were wearing, was this when we had the jackets? I think it was like matching cowboy shirts. Like there's like beige cowboy oh, okay. shirts. Okay, I think the jackets come back into the story. Go on, go on. And uh, little little did we know that a bar owner who owned the Dakota Tavern, Sean Creamer, happened to be walking by and liked what he heard. And he's like, I'm going to support these guys. He bought six of our EPs that we had made ourselves. And he started handing them out uh, to different music people that were hanging out at the Dakota Tavern. And for those that don't know, the Dakota Tavern, very cool little bar, West End of Toronto, where a lot of music people like to hang out. And from there, that's how we got discovered by our first manager and the ball was rolling. And the timing was really serendipitous because the, when we started to work with a manager and a label, it was like two months before the end of our fourth year of university. So we just said, just give us two months and we're yeah. all yours. And a lot of, I think, young musicians, like they finish school, they don't know what to do. Do they go traveling? Do they try to do it full time? How do they balance everything? But we were like kind of set up to work immediately. That's so funny. I was... Four, uh, five months out of my four year graduation when I got the job at CBC. Yeah, oh, there you go. Similar kind of so thing. So lucky though. You, yeah, you get momentum. Yeah. That I way. was like, okay, I got give me five months, and mm -hmm. they were like, no. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll start working and just fail my courses. It worked, it worked out. It worked out okay. We have something to play for you. So this is from two thousand eight. Oh no, I don't know. Sorry, sorry. 
Welcome back, everyone, to the 2008 Desjardins Vanier Cup. I trust everyone's oh, having God. a great time. The Rouge are up 20 points right now at the half. We're in for a good second half. And to kick it off for us, Hamilton's finest playing their hit single. The boss is coming. The Arkells. Just want to let everybody listening know, and they're very nervous looking right now. Everyone sitting with you. I mean, you got to admit it sounded better than you thought it was going to. A little bit. Uh, uh, honestly, a lot of that had to do with Tim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the beat's there, so we're good, yeah. All I can hear is just me desperately trying to sound like Bri from the Constantines. <laughs> even the way even the way I talked to, hey, so how's it going, everyone's stadium? It's like, and the Constantines are one of our favorite bands ever, and he would have talked like that. You know, you were aping them a little bit. Oh, <laughs> just stealing it completely. <laughs> that song is just a cons ripoff. Oh, yeah. Oh, but that's a big song. I mean, that, that song meant a lot to a lot of people when it first came out. It was a bit of a calling card. Of course. For yeah, sure. I mean, I think uh, we were just a more like commercial version of the Constantines with that song. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like we, we like stuck to the pop music formula where the Constantines like didn't do that. But that's what made them so amazing too. So you, you, you saw a sound that you really liked and you said, okay, I, I, I want to put some hooks in here. I want to put some... I I I don't think it was that thought out. I think no. it was like the 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 pop structures were were what we un, what we what we wanted to to have in our music and I also just wanted to play guitar like I was in the Constantines. <laughs> right, right. Uh yeah, just so I was, like that riff is like nighttime anytime. Like that's the riff. But that's that's the part about when you're first starting out like you don't even know that anybody's ever going to hear this stuff, especially yeah. on that first record. You're kind of just like, I'm, you know, taking from wherever I can just to make something that, that works. And so it is a, it is quite the homage, but I think from there we've, we've, we've put enough <laughs> originality in here and there, but yeah, it's, that's, that's, a, that's we saw song. Buble the other night in Calgary. Michael yeah. Buble. Yeah. yeah. And he had a, a story about uh, no, the other Buble, the other Buble, the other Buble. <laughs> Dave, <laughs> Dave Buble. <laughs> yeah, his, I love Dave. His Buble. cousin. Yeah. And he has a story about working with Tony Bennett and being a little sheepish. Cause he's like, you know, Tony, I've, I've stolen from you. You know, I've stolen from Sinatra and Elvis. It's like, I feel kind of like almost embarrassed to be even working with you. And he said, Tony, he said, Michael, if you, uh, if you steal from one person, that's being a thief. But if you steal from everybody it's called doing your research uh, <laughs> and i was like i love that story because that it really feels like who we are in a way was yeah. the was the social um commentary social justice stuff part of it from the beginning where does that come from in you max in your lyrics so there was lyrics kind of right off the bat of that first record mm -hmm. um you know w w w workers rights mm -hmm. um uh, you know larger social progressive issues yeah, I, th I mean, we were poli sci majors, and I think a lot of the the great part about university is that you kind of have time just to sit around and like pontificate on like big ideas and how you want to see the world and what direction you want to you know push your own life into. And and I think you know coming from uh, you know thinking about my parents' music and they grew up in the '60s and and like political songwriters, you know Bob Seger. Um, what do you so, got? Sorry, what do you got through? Pete Seeger. Bob Seeger's pretty good too. Bob Seeger no, no. working <laughs> all my night moves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bob Dylan. You know the band. You know it's like a, you know Stevie Wonder. Yeah. And uh, so I think that was like a, a natural place to to think about uh, when we were songwriting. It was, you, 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 that was important to you. You wanted yeah. to have that in there from the very yeah. Beginning. You know the other things like you know my dad. My dad's a social worker. My mom's a high school teacher. It's like they're always surrounded by really sort of socially conscious people and heroes of mine too, right? And 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 some of those characters. Uh, you know, exists throughout our catalog. You know, it's like Peter Rosenthal, who's a, who's a family friend, who's like a, a moral North Star for our family. And he's he's the subject in A Little Rain song for Pete. So it's like, there's, yeah, those those are people that are top of mind when, when we're writing songs. So when you were growing up in your parents' house, like just down the road from me, actually, mm -hmm. um, when you were growing up in your parents' house, you were at the kitchen table and there were sort of like progressive thinkers and they were getting into, your, whether they weren't there talking about Marxism, no. but they were there talking. They they were talking, and you were soaking it in. Yeah, they're they're not even like the annoying kind, right? Like there was this sort of like lead by example, and who are you hanging out with? Kind of like it's like so you just sort of like oh, you know, everybody's kind of good neighborly people, uh, and uh, but they didn't they didn't hit me over the head with it by any by any means. Uh, but I think I just sort of picked it up, uh, you know, what their intentions are in just like living in a city. I mean, I feel like that does come across in the music. Like it is a very, it's it's very, um, 
it's very inspiring. I feel like it's very progressive, but I feel like in a, in a pretty subtle, accessible way. Yeah, like, you know, Nick's mom's a, a teacher. Mike's mom taught. It's it's like, you know, Tony's dad was a letter carrier. It's like uh, we all, all of our parents had very sort of like middle class jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's a joke that we get to have the job that we do. It's so lucky. And, but I think, but we know where we came from. That it's like, th these are just people that like work really hard in like the service of their community. And so uh, it, it's nice to honor that. Can we play a big song? Um, this is a song from, from High Noon 2014, right? Mm -hmm. This was a, a big song. And still when I see you to this day, uh, you kind of need to play it. Take a listen to this. A little bit of leather jacket from Arkells from their 2014 album High Noon. Max, not as painful to listen to as the nah, 2008. That was a good one. Yeah, it's a good song. <laughs> Mike, when did you know that that song had kind of connected? Because it did, right? That was a big moment for your band. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know when it connected. I can remember listening to it when we finally got like the mix back. That because we worked on that one for quite a while, um, and thinking like this one feels really good. Like you get that feeling of like I don't know. There's something like very like joyful about it but there's also something kind of heavy about it um yeah i i don't i don't remember any sort of we re-recorded that one too like we did yeah. most of the record in la and there's like two or three songs on that album they're like ah we could we should readdress it and mm -hmm. we we re-recorded back home in toronto did you know that that song was gonna no it wasn't even the first single like come to light was the first single i don't know i, I find my i like all the songs i'm like th like i think i'm anything that makes the record i'm just like very 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 pumped on at some point in time so my perspective on it isn't great. Why do you think it's been, why do you think it's landed with so many people? I don't know. It's quirky. The, ly the lyrics are kind of odd. There's, and there's a lot of storytelling in there. Yeah. And it kind of keeps going. Like even in the bridge, it's like there's a narrative that's interesting to follow. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I agree with that. Yeah. I, I think, uh, yeah, it, I think it they're they're like the story itself is sort of relatable, but like quirky and interesting. I think, I think for us, it kind of brought together a couple of different threads of what we had been working on, like musically speaking, like it has, it has pop, but it also sort of has like, like, sorry, it has like the, the rock band thing, but yeah. it also sort of has like elements of like, um, pop and electronic music sort of like in there. And I think that that record was sort of the one where we maybe put those, those together really well um and and that song in particular and i think re-recording it and adding a little bit more of that rock like the rock band thing is kind of what we put back in mm -hmm. so i think it was just like sometimes the recipe is like it's hard to know yeah but i do like thinking about that was okay so i remember lyrically there's a craig finn who's the singer of the hold steady yeah there's a song he has called went called when no one's watching and i love that song so i think lyrically I was trying to ape him a little yeah. bit. And then we were really into the the first Heim record when we were in LA. The one the, with uh, uh, the wire on it? Yeah, and yeah. there's a, the no, 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 that thing that happens at the end of Leather Jacket we just stole directly from mm -hmm. Heim. And then there's like a killer's anthemic thing that we, uh, we do in the, the, the drum beat had like a Tears for Fears thing in my mind. Yeah. So it's like, it's funny to go through like the amalgamation of like all the different references that kind of go into one song. It's an interesting relationship I have with your band because I've known you mm -hmm. um, a really a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think I first met you guys when you played the Breezeway wow, in St. John's. 2011 or something? Maybe, yeah. I was still living in St. John's mm -hmm. at the time. So yeah, maybe 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it was when that record came out and Leather Jacket came out that I went, Oh, they're they're up to something here. Mm. Like they're trying something new, and there there's sort of a a bravery here. They're not just going to sound like an indie rock band mm -hmm. right now. They're going to see what happens. Mm. Yeah, I think that's been a big part of probably our success to a degree. Is that you know all the bands that we mentioned and earlier and bands that we were listening to and going to see at the Casbah, it's like means so much to us and shaped the way we play as musicians, but. After a few years, we're like, okay, what's the next thing? You know, it's like, who else, like, like Hollow Notes? We, can we say we like Hollow Notes? Because at the time, 
it wasn't really cool to say we liked Hollow Notes, but like, no, we kind of love Hollow Notes. And that's like kind of makes its way into the second record. And then the third record, we're talking about electronic references. Like, oh, that M83 record's amazing. And so just not being afraid to kind of just go for it and, and to take swings that, you know, feel a little bit outside of your comfort zone. What what you're saying is that the, it's it's not about like oh I think Holland Oaks would be uh, Holland Oaks would be a- advantageous to us or uh, M83 M83 would be mm-hmm. advantageous. It's like we we like this. we like it and yeah. when I find it interesting that you also said are we allowed to like it because mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of meekness uh, and re- or insecurity I think uh, with that indie rock scene that we came from yeah I don't know it's like sometimes I want bands just to go for it a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, or to not be afraid not, to, mm. to, to, to say that they like what they like. I know mm. this is dangerous, dangerous chats here, but you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. but you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that is, I, I heard that kind of start on that record. Yeah, I, I, think, I think taking those chances just meant kind of, I, like, I think the advantageous part is sort of like, I think more often it's easy to kind of think like, okay, this thing we did worked, so it's more advantageous for us to like, definitely there's going to be, be, be people who like that. Like, let's just give them more of that. Mm-hmm. And if, if you're starting to think of it in this like safety first, like what's, what's the stable way to do it. So I think that's where the risk comes in where you go, like there's a very, a very real possibility that there's going to be people who do not like this, that liked that, that we did before. And I think that that has also probably been a part of our career that, you know, if you liked Jackson square, mm-hmm. There might be, there's probably a lot of stuff that we've done since then that you do not like, mm-hmm. but, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. Um, you know, but I'd say the payoff and I agree with that. Yeah. And the payoff though is like, okay, eleven eleven. It's like, you, I remember things like, is this just too corny? It's like, you made a wish at eleven eleven. I held your hips at 1234. That's like, so on the nose, pop romantic songwriting. And it was unlike anything from our first two records. I was like, but then, but the payoff was amazing because then it's like a bunch of people were like, oh, that's my favorite song. And I'm like, oh, and we, and we probably opened ourselves to a lot of new listeners that didn't even have any interest in the first two records. Totally. By being honest to yourself, yeah, you, like, like, you, you, like, you met like-minded people. Yeah. And like, sometimes you're like, is this corny or is this kind of sweet? So Mike, is this, is this, is this intentional or like, what is this connection between our Kells <laughs> and, and sports? I find this really interesting. Um... Maybe uh, probably a little bit intentional, but that's okay. I think you know, sports and music kind of go well together. Like the you know, I like I I do think like knocking at the door kind of has like jock jam vibes, and I'm like <laughs> totally okay with that. Because like sometimes you want something that like pumps you up, and that's yeah. like I think there's definitely a lot of different types of songs that that we've put together, and that Max writes, and this one this one is just like it pumps you up. It makes you want to like you know run through a wall kind of vibe, <laughs> which is like, cool. Uh, it, it, yeah. As for the sports stuff, I think that comes pretty genuinely. Like yeah. even when we used to be touring around and it was really inconvenient to like get to a game or something like that, we would like walk across a town to like go to a baseball game, like mm-hmm. me, Max and Nick, like we would just like, and I don't, I don't really grow up. I didn't grow up like loving like traditional sports all that much, but uh, have kind of learned to love them through these guys, like coming to basketball games and and baseball games in particular, uh, because that's their like strong mm-hmm. passion that they've had always. So I'm I'm happy for them. <laughs> I'm happy for them finding their way into like you know the the sports world In, into that. Max, am I overthinking things here? Uh, I, what, what's the question? Though? I don't understand what you're getting at. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Am I am I am I overthinking things and drawing a connection between Arkell's music and and kind of sports? No, I mean I think the music comes from like a very genuine place. Okay, here's here's the story. If you want the the full knocking at the door story, there we go. Okay, so uh, no, we're on tour with Frank Turner in January of 2017. British singer songwriter, yeah. Frank Turner, very political. He's got a really awesome audience. Yeah. We're in D.C. the night of or the day of Trump's inauguration. Yeah. So it's like you're you're there and people are really upset. And we're kind of upset. It's just a kind of a weird time in America. We start working, like I think on the road, just with a little demo of knocking at the door. So that, and, and our record, Morning Report, had just come out, I think the previous, like three, four months ago. So it was a brand new record, but you're always kind of working away and stuff. Yeah. So we have a little demo. We get home from tour. We have a little demo. It's probably like a minute and a half of knocking at the door. Just like something that we assume we will get around to later but it's a song about the women's march it's a song about like being so inspired by the hundreds of thousands of people that were marching on dc and and wanting to be heard and so that's where the the song comes from it's just like being so inspired by people taking the streets for i think a really good cause to protest this vile dude yeah 
the Blue Jays <laughs> reach out, Blue Jays and Budweiser reached out and going, hey, we need like a, a song to start, uh, to kick off the season. Yeah. That was March, early March. We I go for lunch with with a few of the guys and they go, and it's March, I think, 11th. Yeah. And I was like, well, we have this song. I play the, the, the crappy demo off my phone at the lunch table. I'm like, just knocking at the door. I don't know. It could be good. And they're like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Our friend Andrew goes, yeah, I think that's, that should be the song. We're like, well, it's not a real song. It needs, <laughs> it's not out. Like, it's just a, a minute and a half demo. He says, okay, well, can you record it? I was like, okay. So then I leave the lunch. I call the guys. I'm like, all right, guys, we got to record this song because I think it could be kicking off the Jay season in a month. <laughs> it's April 7th is the day the Jays kick off. So yeah. we record the song on like the 13th, 14th, and 15th. We literally go in the studio with, with our producer, Eric Ratz, who's an awesome talent, amazing guy here in Toronto. We bang out the song. And it's a pretty I- intricate song. There's like... Oh, absolutely. And and I, I will say it's actually one of the first times that I think we, in recorded music, sort of featured this sort of larger group of musicians, mm. like with the horns and singers, like Arquettes and the Northern Soul Horns, who have become so integral to what we do live. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Jock Jam is definitely reductive, but I do think there's a certain bombast that we put into <laughs> it, knowing that like it could have been in this place where it's sort of like, you know, just would feel big, you know? Yeah. So we record the song, we, we film a music video uh, at the end of March, and then the Jays kick off their season. I think we put out the song on the 7th, and the Jays kicked off the season on the 9th of April. Mm-hmm. So in less of, less of course of a month, um, you know, the song was sort of completed, and a music video was made, and it was in a commercial with the Jays. So it's like, and I think so much of that, I think, was like in part driven. Uh, we just started working with uh, Ashley Potovin, our manager, and, and, and Chris Taylor. And we're like, we can do this? Can we work like this? Because, And I think I'd always been sort of jealous that like you'd see pop acts and hip hop acts turn things around quickly. Yeah. And the old model for rock and roll bands is like, no, the only way you can write a song is if you labor in the studio for nine months. Yeah. And then you hum and haw about the mix for another three. You know, it's like, ah, but I, we just have this idea. There's this burst of excitement and creativity. Can we just do it right now? And so it was actually really, I think, illuminating for us to know that we could work that way. Working on deadline, I think, is really important and and, and a really good motivator. And uh, and and I think we've done that a lot since, being like, oh, we we can trust our musical ability and our instincts to make awesome stuff. It feels like what I'm hearing, like throughout this whole interview up until this point, is that there's like a convention that you are up against mm-hmm. as, as an indie rock band, yeah, and you are constantly trying to exist without that convention outside of that convention. But while acknowledging it's very, very hard to do that. Mm-hmm. The the uh, first case is like, hey, we want to bring in some more pop music into our indie rock sound. Mm-hmm. Are we allowed to do that? Mm-hmm. Oh, we did it anyway. It, it kind of worked out. Are we allowed to have songs in sports commercials? Oh, we kind of, we, but we re- genuinely really like sports, as Mike said. It's a big part of our lives. Can this work? Are we allowed to be this band? Oh, turns out we are and, mm-hmm. and, and it worked. Are we allowed to release albums? Uh, sorry, are we re- allowed to release music on a less, con- more consistent schedule? Mm-hmm. I have an idea. I want to put it out. I have an idea. I want to put it out. As opposed to laboring and trying to make Ziggy Stardust once every three years. Yeah, I, I feel a pressure that I'm not allowed to do that. Oh wait, I am allowed to do that, and it worked out. Yeah. Can we not just wear plaid shirts and black skinny jeans? Watch can, it. Can, can, watch it. Watch out. <laughs> watch it. I'm, no, right, we, I'm right here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but like, okay, Mike's wearing a suit now. It's like, and I have this fringe jacket, and it's like a rainbow fringe and I'm like dressing up or I'm maybe wearing a little makeup sometimes or I'm painting my nails. Like, can I, I don't know. And it's funny too, cause I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, Gen Z's who are listening to stuff like, yeah, you can do all this stuff, man. Well, like, well, why do you like, feel what, trapped? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, just be yourself, you know? And, uh, but I think just the, the millennial generation that we are and, and the scene that we came from was sort of timid and was a little bit, you know, f- afraid to sort of take bolder chances. And and I think, I don't know, I feel like we've just been rewarded with every time we, we take a chance. Like but that, that doesn't make, make it easy. That doesn't make it easy to take those chances. No, it's it can be scary. <laughs> it can be scary to mm-hmm. want to go, hey, I want to do something different and we might get some criticism for it. Mm-hmm. But we have, a ni- we have a nice audience. Most yeah. people are kind of along for the ride. I also think we do a pretty good job pulling back the curtain on things and being like, hey, this is stuff we like. This is stuff that we really care about. And when you establish that rapport, I think people are more accepting of it. How are you finding the? Did you guys see the Animal Collective story? Mm. That um, they, they what is it, Mitch? They they went off the road, right? Because they they yeah they can't they can't afford the tour, and it's been it's been really bad on their mental health. I mean, mm-hmm. you guys work a lot mm-hmm. more than most bands I know. 
How are you, how are you finding all that stuff? How do you make sure to take care of yourself? Hmm. Well, it's definitely hard. Uh, there's a it's a lot more complicated, um, I think, and and especially for the people like our management and our crew and stuff who have to deal with a lot of the details of of touring post COVID and and the budgets and stuff like that. It's certainly more difficult, and I think, um, I think it's just it's a combination of the factors. I think there's a lot of bands on tour right now. Uh, there's a lot of people coming back kind of out, of out of the woodwork. Like Blink-182 is one of my favorite bands ever. Glad they're coming back. But like, it's just one of those times where it's like, there's so many bands that are trying to tour right now. Like all of a sudden it's, it's crazy. Like I, I, for the, for the average music, uh, the, 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 for the average concert goer, it's great. It's great. But it's also like, how many concerts can you possibly yeah. go to in a month? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that Blink-182 concert just took away probably 1,200 ticket sales from various concerts in Toronto. Oh, yeah. They're like, oh, okay, I'm going to probably just go to that one because it's expensive. But yeah, what, it's but, like if you spend $300 on a concert, like are you going to go spend $50 on another one? Like maybe not. Like, And, and that's uh, – uh, I don't know that the Animal Collective Blink-182 crossover is that significant, <laughs> but uh, I do think that it's tough. It's really tough out there because mm. there's, there's a finite amount of venues – and there's a finite amount of, amount of money and it's and it is more expensive than it was like even if six months ago the tour seemed like it made sense like maybe it doesn't six months later so I don't know it's it, it is really difficult what about the strain of just having to put out a bunch of stuff we had Tate McRae in mm. uh, a couple of weeks ago sure. you know big uh, Calgarian yeah. TikTok star probably the biggest thing mm-hmm. big, uh, biggest artist to get big on TikTok and I said to her are you ever wistful for those uh, millennial days you heard about mm-hmm. <laughs> where you could what she say? put out an album I'm getting to it uh-huh. and you could put out <laughs> Put out, put out, I'm just building suspense. You could put out an album every two years and take some time off and write an album. I don't want to paraphrase here, but she said something like, you know, that, that sounds nice, but it's just not the mm-hmm. reality of it anymore. And I said, how is that for you? And she said, it's a bit hard on my brain. It's a bit mm-hmm. hard on my brain to have to keep up and make TikToks and think about mm-hmm. creating all, all, all the time. Yeah, no, it's absolutely hard. And I think musicians are put under a lot of stress and asked to do a lot of things that are uh, much more than just being music makers and performers. And yeah, and there's so much competition out there. There's more competition than ever. There's no gatekeepers anymore, which is amazing, but also makes things confusing because there's no like path anymore. It's like, oh, you hope you have a song that blows up on TikTok and that's sort of the strategy. And no one, there's no like, it's hard to formulate game plans because everything seems like success feels kind of more random than ever. Um, and we're lucky though that we have like a base and, and like of, of fans and people that are sort of aware of the band that we have a bit of a leg up in that way. But I would say that's like, I what I try to remember is that it's like the job we have is so um, lucky, and we're lucky that we all really like each other, and and everybody has their kind of strength in the lane that they play in uh, when it comes to their work in Arkells. Yeah, and I just want to hold on to it so badly. So it's like I remember during the pandemic, I was like. I, I was just confused with how TikTok worked. I was like, because it's unlike any other app that we're used to, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And it took me probably like six or eight months to kind of like understand how to use it. And now I've come to kind of like it and I, and making TikTok content is something I've like learned to enjoy. But that was a mental hurdle that took a long time. And I think like like any sort of entrepreneurial pursuit, you have to evolve with the time as best as you can. And that's just a fact of the matter. Like, you know, I could... There's lots of things I'm annoyed about with the music industry, but like for practicality's sake, I'm, I just try to think, okay, how can we best play? How can we know who yeah. we are, the context that we're in, and like and be heard? Because all we want is our songs to be heard. All we want is people to buy tickets to a, a concert. And so it's like I I take it as like an everyday challenge. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm gonna do something today, and then and you know, I I can get you know, some little bit of satisfaction that I did something kind of creative and, uh, you know, and we're working in a new world. Because the other thing is I keep in mind is that both, almost every band that we started with in 2008 that was like a peer of ours isn't a band anymore. Or right. if they are, they're not working that much. And it's not because they're not good. It's not because our songs are better. It's just because like we've had some good luck and we've been really incredibly diligent at being like, creative in a way that feels authentic every day. And and we have a bit of that sort of like, I hate using the word entrepreneurial when we're talking about art, but like 
that that go getterness, that keener thing that I think is important. I don't. Yeah, I don't think there's anything to be embarrassed about when it comes to wanting to to have <laughs> ambition. And your answer is not dissimilar to Tate's, which was. Yeah, sure, whatever. But like, this is the reality of the world I'm living in, mm -hmm. and I want to figure out a way that I can do it in a way that I enjoy it. Yeah, I think I, I, I think that's a big thing. It's like, how can you figure out how to how to do it authentically? And I, I and there hasn't been any really any moments where we're like, oh, we did that thing, and looking back, that was like so stupid that we did that, but we did that because we just had to play the game. It's like no, everything we do is like we just genuinely like. I don't know. I mean, that's that seems to be the theme theme of the interview. Speaking of authenticity, let's play a track from the new record. All I wanna do is hold you. Feel you in the middle of the night You let your guard down for me Saying I'm all yours This is all mine Pour some liquor, drink it straight up My favorite shirt and some Nikes I promised you I'd take it if the cops showed up Cops showed up Now you think that every word I said was made up Like I was coasting on your love Yes. Yeah, I fucked it up, but babe, I never faked it. You got me drowning in, drowning in these. Now you clear out all your stuff. Dark Hells and the song Teenage Tears. Um, Max and Tegan and Sarah joining in on that one. Uh, Max, I'll, just, I'll open it up. Tell me a little bit about that song. Yeah, that's um, a song from Blink Twice. And, you know, there's a lot of songs from Blink Once and Blink Twice that are kind of written through the pandemic and just like the changes that I was going through in my life. And, you know, I think the I have a hard time. I'm not the best communicator when it comes to like hard conversations uh, in my personal life. And I and I and it's interesting sometimes like listening back to lyrics that I'm like, oh, if I just said that <laughs> or been a little bit more vulnerable in the moment, everybody could have felt, been a little better off. Um, yeah, and I mean, that's one of the nice things about songwriting, of course, is that you get a chance to express yourself in ways that are hard to in everyday life. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a relationship song and we wanted... Uh, to, to hear more voices on the record. Yeah. And and we reached out to, uh, to Tegan and Sarah to see if they'd, they'd share the bill with us on that, and then they agreed. Yeah, listen, we, we don't have to talk about anything you don't want to talk mm -hmm. about. Uh, the, the It is a, a, a more vulnerable mm -hmm. Arkell's record than I have heard before. I'll tell you that much. Oh, well, thanks. I'm glad. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting listening back to some of the stuff, but... Uh, that, that's why songs exist, is to kind of <laughs> speak to those vulnerable moments. And hey, what's it like for you, Mike? I'll, I'll, I'll go to there. Like when, when these songs come your way, when these demos, when these, you know? Yeah, you know, that one in particular, the demo of that song was very, like very heavy mm. and very emotional. And, and I remember it just being very like powerful. And immediately, like I sat down at a piano, I was like trying to figure out what was happening and just like, just kind of like live in it kind of in a way and just like get, getting that kind of goosebumpsy feeling. So that's sort of my relationship with it. And I think um I think the the honest nature and the like um yeah, like the unguarded uh parts of it are what makes it powerful and I think yeah. what will make it a song that will endure. You know, I think those are the those are the qualities. It's hard to know what will, but I think those are the qualities that that yeah. are important. You know, like, and one of my my favorite, the most, one of the most rewarding parts of the job is just like getting DMs from people that go, oh, that, the thing you're saying in that song really is helping me or I really relate to. And, you know, so it's like getting that feedback and you go, okay, this is, it kind of pushes you to keep doing that. It's a, it's a beautiful song. Why the collaborators on this record, Mike? There's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. there, there is a lot of them. Um, I think, I think. For Max, I think it was like, <laughs> like, like he, he says it kind of as a joke, but I think like not having to sing every verse is kind of like nice. <laughs> uh, I just want to hear somebody else sing. Like, I yeah, was like, yeah. oh man, Tina Sarah on our song. Like, but it, but it, it really works very well. And, and I thought like, you know, all of the collaborations for their own reasons, like I can hear Max's songwriting in it, but I can also hear the other the other side of it like uh you know would like Joel Plaskett for example like, yeah and and they and they made it they made their own adjustments everywhere like uh, or sometimes just did the whole thing but it's like there's I don't know it's just, it, it is a really interesting um 
collaboration that we've done here because I think it's slightly different than than other collaborations I've heard in the sense that just I I really feel their personalities they in these songs. Br- they bring themselves in addition to just their vocals, they bring themselves and their style and their sort of like mentality to the music. Yes, and I also think that they're not like oh like like th- this would be great because of this and this and that. It's like they would actually be perfect for this song. Right. And I think that they 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 bring their personalities bring a lot to the songs. There's also a very selfish feeling that I'm constantly chasing in our work, which is just like this feeling of just like absolute delight. Like, and this happens all the time and it's, and I'm addicted to it where it's like, it's like the it's guys, Nick Nurse, who just won a championship, just came on stage and played Science Field Deliver. How awesome is that? <laughs> so that's exciting for you too, is what you're oh, saying. Oh, it's only oh, yeah. that's that's where all these ideas from like how crazy would it be <laughs> if Wes from the Lumineers sang on the song? And then we got Jay Clemens from the E Street band to wail on and, and it's our song. Like how amazing. <laughs> it's like it's like don't get it twisted. It's like this is like purely just like, guys, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's and it's yeah, and the fact that we and can <laughs> I love it. It's and it's also like we're like, how'd this happen? It's like Max just dropping in the DMs. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I sent uh, send him a text, you know? Yeah. <laughs> how do you, exactly. how do you get it up on this show? Let's yeah. uh <laughs> let's uh let's take a listen to this. Arkells alongside Kier de Birat and Ali and AJ performing <laughs> Dance With You. Max singing in French, by the way. <laughs> you know, earlier I was saying, like, is 11 11, 12 34? Is that a little corny? Is that going to work? That was, that's this version, uh, that, this album's version of that. Yeah. Which is like, what if I sang in French? Would that be kind of cool? <laughs> I don't know. Let's try it. Where did that idea come from? And during the pandemic, I was listening to a lot of French music in the mornings. So like, you know, really? just, yeah, yeah, you know, Serge Gainsbourg and old 60s French music, just like a Spotify playlist. Wow. And, and like French, like modern electronic, like dance music, like by French DJs and stuff. Wow, look out. Yeah. And I just loved it. I was like, oh, it'd just be kind of cool to do that. And honestly, it, it's the going theme for the beginning of our band. It's like, wouldn't it just be cool to do that? Like yeah. listening to someone, getting pumped up and doing that. But but <laughs> is it, is it, is it um, like, uh, you have also done something, Mike, that uh, not a lot of bands have, which has been, with some exceptions, been a band with the same people in it generally for a very, very long time, almost almost since the beginning. Mm-hmm. Is it is what is that like to bring outsiders sort of into that process? I, I think it's great. It's it's always been great. Um, I mean, the like the ver- I I kind of can can find love for all the different versions, you know, like the like scrappy like like five scrappy dudes like mm-hmm. with their guitars and an amp and like that's all you need like that I totally think that that's there's some merit there and I but I also like you know we'll like post something on Instagram and then like I'll be like scrolling through my own Instagram feed and it'll come up and there's just like 20 people or whatever like 15 people on stage and like stuff going on and like I'm like is that me up there too like in this <laughs> situation so it's like these are all experiences that I think bring just different complexions to to what we've done, and and I think if it was just still five scrappy dudes, like we would, yeah, it would be it would probably be like too crazy, like to it, I don't know that we, we we would be able to to have done that. I think including new people adds new life and and yeah. and uh, and inspiration to what we do, um, and it just informs that core, you know. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing, you know. I mean, the, the story that I wasn't expecting to tell in this interview has has been really something else, you know. To see that it has been a, as we were talking about earlier, a sort of um, an embracing of authenticity, like an embracing of actual authenticity, mm-hmm. not like phony hip authenticity, but the things I actually like and the things I actually want, whether that is um, French music or, or whether that's, um, being in a really big band, mm-hmm. you know, um, or, or I remember I was talking to someone recently who was a banjo player and it was starting to really happen for her, which is a weird thing to say, but like, <laughs> she was getting assigned to a record label. Hey, 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 don't love this laughter, <laughs> yeah. but it was starting to really happen for her. And I said to her and I, she was getting all this advice and, and from people and she was just like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get signed to this label and I think I'm going to open up for an old crow medicine show oh, wow. who are like the Beatles of the folk world. Sure. Right. And, uh, and I was like, oh yeah, fair enough. I mean, that sounds really she goes like, I know everyone's trying to talk me out of it though. They said, you know, you don't want to sell out, you know, and I should, just, I should try to make these recordings by myself. It was a long, 
long story. And I said, oh I said, it's easy to find yourself surrounded by people who are going to tell you to keep it. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't do any of that. But you also got to remember to find yourself surrounded by people who are going to go, yeah, d come on, do it. Mm -hmm. Come on. Don't be, if that's something that you want, you should be allowed to do that. Yeah. I really admire like authentic amb ambitious people. Um, I'll tell you a little story. So we have another collaboration with uh, Wes Schultz from Lumineers and Jay Clemens from the East Street Band. Big, big folk band. And then Jay Clemens who took over from his uncle, Clarence Clemens, Clarence Clemens. the East Street Band. Yeah. So, we, so it's a song, Tony started, our keyboard player Tony started the song. It has this very sort of Springsteen sounding piano part. So I write the first verse, send it to Wes. I'm like, Wes, would you want to sing on this? Just the lyric. And then he, he writes back and he's like, I like the song, but I think you can do better with the lyrics, Max. So, so I'm like, oh, okay. I've never got that feedback before. I was like, okay, cool. Like, but let me let me try to impress you. I like the challenge. So I, I rewrote my my verse. I sent it back to him. He's like, yeah, I like this a lot. Okay, I'll write my part. He writes his part, and then we're the, the bridge is sitting there. We don't know ex exactly what to do yet. Is it a guitar solo? More lyrics? What, is it? what if is what if Jake played sax? We have some mutual friends. I reach out to, to Jake. He he's like, I'm in. So he delivers this crazy E Street uh, sounding. Sax solo, like, okay. and he'll do it. He doesn't mind being like, "I'll do the East Street thing." Sure, you got it. Yeah, no, but he heard the song, <laughs> and he and he and he was connected to it. So then I got really like uh, cocky, and I was like, "You know what this song needs? Bruce Springsteen." <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, I, "Okay, someone get me Bruce's email or Bruce's manager's email." So I send an, an email to Bruce's manager, and I go, "Hey, we got this song. Your boy's on it. Your other New Jersey uh, native uh, is on it. I think you should sing on it." And then 24 hours later, we got an email back from Bruce's lawyer going, thank you so much for the inquiry. Bruce is not available for this. Best of luck. But I was like, you know what? Respect to Bruce Springsteen. He got back in less time than every other indie rock joker <laughs> hanging out at the bar on Queen Street who fancies himself a real musician who doesn't get back to me sometimes. So I was just like, so my respect for the boss who I love only grew because I was like, that is a guy who runs a tight ship, Yeah, you know, and, and that's why he's been doing it for 50 years, because he gets back to people's emails. <laughs> there, you know, there's like, it's, this says something there about him, and it makes me love him even more. You you love him because he's an incredible artist who writes incredibly good, creative, beautiful, groundbreaking music, and he has his shit together. Yeah, exactly. And as Mike pointed out, it's like, you know what, Max, you probably cost Springsteen $500 in legal fees <laughs> just sending that email. <laughs> well, I've already, I've already told you um, how much I love the record, and I've already told you, uh, I mean, I think you guys know how much I love you guys. Mm. And uh, congrats on it. And I think it's it's really something else. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks for coming Thank in you. and breaking it all down. I guess we have another, you have another half career to go now. That's right. Mm -hmm. Let's check that, back in. Is in, that uh, weird? Another... Is that a weird thing to hear? That yeah. like, It is funny because it's like, I don't feel old, but you know, like Mike and I are 35, 36 years old. Yeah. But it's like, we've been doing this for a while now. Yeah. We have seven records. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of records. Definitely looking back, like those early days, like could not have could not have imagined that we would still be doing it this long into the future. So 20 years from now, who knows what we're going to be doing. Yeah, we have seven records in 14 years. That's, or, oh, oh, and eight if you include uh, Campfire Chords. So we work a lot. 14, I'm 14 years in. I started when I was 21 at the CBC. Wow. I, I never thought... I still think I've been here three years. Yeah. <laughs> I, still, I still act like I've been here in three years. Maybe that's, that's, maybe, that's the key, maybe, you know? Yeah. Just got to keep on having that three-year in energy. Well, that's, I think, a big part of, like, yeah. why we keep trying new stuff, because it just makes it feel like it's, oh, this is, like, the first three years. Like, you know, you want that feeling of newness yeah. and where you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah like, exa exactly, like, you don't know what you're doing. Like, when you first time you pick up an instrument and you come up with something cool, that's actually like it. That's when the you, best feeling. Yeah, that's the best. The beginner's mind, they call that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Max and Mike from Arkell, thanks for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you.